Hi everyone and welcome to today's art chat. I will go ahead and throw things over to Linda, but real quick I just want to let everyone know that they can type their questions into the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel and I'll be here to relay those on to Linda and her guest Scott for you. So welcome Linda, how are you doing today? Thanks, Sarah. I'm doing really well, and I'm really, really excited about this talk. Every time I talk to Scott, we've talked actually once on the phone prior to this, and then right before we came on the air, I, I always get really excited because he's got a lot of things going on, and um, he's just a super sweet guy. I, you know, sorry, I guess I should apologize to your wife, Scott, for that, but <laughs> you really are. <laughs> and um, uh, let's see, what we wanted to talk a little bit about the creative process and um, I actually first want to welcome you to the show. I'm, I'm very happy that you said you would do this and um, I know that we've had a lot of people sign up. We've got a lot of people sitting out there listening to us right now. So welcome to the show, Scott. Well, thanks for having me, uh, Sarah and Linda. It's really fun to be here. Yeah, it's. Um, we're going to start off with a, a real quick question. One of my listeners, one of my devoted listeners, Ida, hey Ida, um, said to me that I should ask you this question first. Um, and it starts out with, what is creativity? Um, she says, I think making up a story, which we're going to talk about Scott's um, book, uh, Nihila. And I'm sorry if I said that wrong, Scott. And then um, we're going to talk about painting process as well. But I think she says, I think making up a story is the ultimate creative act. Painting is creative in a different way, in that one is creating, meaning making a painting, but painting creative is in the same way that making up a story is creative. So she's just wants a basic general um, idea about what is creative or being creative. And if I could throw in a definition, if you go out and you look at creative out on Webster dictionary. It says, relating to or involving the imagination or original ideas, especially in the production of an artistic work. So, and then the second version of that is a per, or second um, noun, if you will, definition is a person who is creative, typically in a professional context. So, Scott, what is creativity to you? Well, that's, I mean, that's a really good question. It's, it's, it's a kind of a complicated question. It is. Uh, you can almost <laughs> do a whole show on just that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think your, the definition that you read is, is, is good. It's, I would definitely say uh, the simplest definition is creative. creativity is uh, seeing something new, you know, in a unique way. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're, you're basically seeing it in your, in your mind first. Uh, now, as far as um, uh, the... Um, question from the questioner about uh, the difference between you know telling a story I think that uh, both in writing and in painting you're telling a story I think the main difference is that in, in writing you're telling a story uh, in words and you're telling uh, a visual story in painting at least that's that's the way I look at painting now certainly modern artists would differ because they feel like uh, the concept and the you know the uh, uh, the, the written explanation is is almost more well is more important than the visual but for me uh, it's a visual story that I'm telling in a painting mm -hmm. and so when I I mean I think that creativity uh, can be and not just painting or, or or that it can be just about anything I mean it can be uh, you know writing science it could be producing um, you know a, a, a machine an invention a sculpture gardening architecture or I mean, dance, song, any of all of those things basically um, first have to uh, be in your mind. So they're mm -hmm. kind of uh, not in a physical form. And so the creativity comes from, the creativity really comes from coming up with the with that idea, that vision of what your story is. Or, or even, even if it's something out there and when you're painting and you see something, um, a face or a scene, uh, you might think, well, that's not as creative because you're just painting what you see. But uh, the real creative aspect is how you're going to interpret it, what you're not going to put in. If you just simply copy every single little thing in the scene, um, there's some creativity maybe if you've set up the model or you've set up the lighting. Um, but a lot of the creativity comes in how you're interpreting that. So if you've ever seen a group of people painting, um, the same model, for example, under the same lighting, and you'll see how differently everybody interprets it. And the better the artists, the more you'll see this because they have the skill to actually put on the canvas uh, 
what they have in their mind. Now, if you haven't yet got your skills, uh, it's very difficult and it's frustrating because you can't get your vision onto the canvas. Um, or just as if a writer didn't know grammar, hadn't actually learned, you know, it's very, very difficult for them to try and say what they're trying to say. Um, so that, that's the first part of it, I think. Now, uh, the, the second part is, uh, is I, th I see two aspects to creativity in trying to tell a story, both in writing and in painting. I think there's the, um, the technical aspect, so you know, learning to spell and that sort of thing. And then there's the, um, the story aspect, the kind of the emotional aspect. So I think that there is definitely similarities. Whereas I, I think of like, if I'm telling a story, like a simple example of, I guess if you came up with some, some sort of simple sentence, um, like you said, like Jill, Jill walked up the mountain through, through the mist. Um, that would be telling a statue. You're telling a story in a very direct way. You're saying what happened. Um, or you could say it in, in a, it's the same thing, but in a more artistic, creative way. So say you said, uh, Jill ascended the slopes of the enshrouded uh, giant as if entering an enchanted world. Um, that conveys the same, you know, literal thing, but it makes it a little bit more interesting. You're, 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 you're imbuing it with some emotion. And I see that in painting the same way to where I, there's a thousand ways I can paint something. Um, the most literal way, like that first sentence, would be I'm going to paint it kind of photorealistically and paint every single thing I see as exactly with no brushstrokes. Or you can decide, am I going to use a brushstroke here that I'm just going to use one brush stroke and try to make the brush stroke itself look interesting and have character so that the brush stroke by itself is interesting on that abstract level um, but it also is in the right place to tell the visual story that you're doing so I kind of see both in in writing and in painting that similarity of mm -hmm. okay you've got what you want to say and then you've also got how you're going to say it and the two together uh, can be done in so many ways that that's where the creativity comes in. I mean, you can say that same sentence a thousand different ways for, for all different, you know, feels and emotions. And, you know, so that's where your creativity as a writer or an artist comes in. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it's really interesting is that um, I don't typically see that much of a difference. Like some folks would think that it's, you know, I've been painting for 20 years uh, it's a really stretch for me to write something, a short story, a, a how-to instruction lesson. You know, that's a stretch I can't write, and they put up a block you know, almost right away. And you know, I don't see that because, and it sounds like you don't either. You know, because I, it's just one extension of creativity. It's another form to express yourself. Well, I, I definitely agree that it's just another form of expressing yourself, but I, I do understand the frustration. Um, you know, Sue a lot of times will write, kind of write out very simple, like that first sentence of what she wants to say, and I'll help her edit it. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of it comes from the fact that I've, I've always written, so I've always loved writing, and I've always loved painting. So um, you have the tools to express what you're saying. It could be very frustrating if you haven't painted before and you have this wonderful idea for a painting and you don't know how to mix paint or you don't know how to do that. It's kind of the same with writing. So you have to have put in enough time in the technical aspect of both mm -hmm. uh, to really feel uh, accomplished. So you may still have that creativity to have a story that you want to tell. Uh, in either visual or in in language, but if you don't haven't put the time in, like for me, take, taking life drawing classes for uh, two years uh, in high school on Saturdays in the summer, and then three full years while I was at the American Academy of Art, um, that wasn't really very creative um, life drawing class. I mean, because the model set up for you, all you're trying to do is make a nose look like a nose, make the figure in the right proportion, draw it in charcoal, very realistically. That's not that creative, but it's giving you those tools that eventually uh, you will then be able to use those tools um, in your creative expression. And it's the same thing with writing. You have to do a lot of it. You have to learn, you know, what do passive verbs mean? What do filters mean? All of these sorts of things so that you can tell the story, um, you know, clearly 
and convey the real emotion that you're going for in, in, in the story. Right, exactly. When you were talking about the, the different parts about writing, what popped in my mind, have you ever diagrammed a sentence? Well, I did that in high school, you know, <laughs> uh, all that stuff, but I don't diagram it, diagram it now. But, um, I mean, it's kind of like, it, it's the same thing with, with painting. Um, you know, you learn to, I mean, when I was first starting out drawing, you know, head measure every single thing out, you know, right. study, because you're learning how to measure, how to see, how to do things, so you have to be very technical. Now, later, as your drawing improves, that stuff becomes somewhat unconscious, and I may... If it's a very complicated painting, I may, like the one that's on the screen now. That mm -hmm. took me three days to draw the whole thing out. And I did use head measuring. I was using like ten different photographs to get all the, of the heads correctly in the right, um, in the right space, uh, uh, you know, uh, perspective, perspective and everything. Perspective. Yeah. And so that I measured out a little bit more than I would. But if I'm doing a smaller painting or something else which only has a few figures or something, I don't measure anymore. It's just like diagramming the sentence. You know, you, you kind of almost like uh, uh, internalize those lessons. Uh, you have to go through them, but nowadays I wouldn't diagram the sentence anymore because you know, you've, you've learned those lessons. You almost just hear how they're right you know, or right. wrong. Right, exactly. Yeah. And for the folks that uh, aren't word nerds like Scott and I, um, PM me and I'll explain what diagramming a sentence is. <laughs> Um, so let's let's go back to the creative process a little bit, and maybe with this photo that's up here, it might be easier for us to walk through kind of what the creative process is for um, painting. Um, so, like, what questions do you ask yourself? What strikes you when you're out there looking? Um, you, well, it, like it, this this painting is a good example of of all the different things that go into it. I, I recently just did one last year too for the. Um, Pre West show that was a, a large painting, even larger than this one. It was like six foot by six foot, of wow. many people, and um, from a from a, a powwow in in Idaho. And um, uh, so th this kind of painting, uh, and I've done ones like this with Africa with many people. So there's right from the very start when you're now this is not done from life, of course, because this is from India. A trip we took to India, and we were just driving. We had our own driver for the whole month, uh, and car that we hired. And we were driving through the desert, and we just came across this huge procession in the middle of absolutely nowhere of people from a village uh, walking, and they're carrying things on their heads um, as a as a like a village um, uh, procession for the god Krishna. And um, so I, you know, jumped out of the car and ran out of there. Sue stayed in in the car because it was it was it was pretty hot and pretty dusty, and there was just a lot of people, and they're all going. And so I knew I wanted to do a painting of this. I I mean. It was just such a beautiful scene. Um, it was kind of overwhelming how many there were. But what I was thinking about, since I was at that moment thinking like a painter, and not just thinking about the photos. So if I was just a photographer, I would just move here, move there, and take pictures and take pictures. But for a painting like this, uh, since everybody was moving past, um, this painting doesn't. This photo doesn't show the whole painting. There's more to the left and right of the painting and above. It's it's even bigger than it looks in there. So there's mm -hmm. about 30 or 35 people. So what I did would do is I and I do this a lot on trips uh, when there's large things happening like this. Is I find a spot and I just hold my camera in the one spot and I take pictures and take pictures and take pictures as all the people are streaming by. But I don't move the camera. I don't crouch down or go up. I'll take a whole series of them, maybe for like at least 10 minutes as everybody goes by. And then I may find another viewpoint. In fact, there was a guy there who would, um, uh, it was so nice, uh, he had a little old motorcycle and I would jump on the back of that and we would zoom through the desert uh, and then get back in front of the procession and then I would take more pictures. Now the reason for that is because I, since I knew I wanted to do a painting of this and I knew that I it, you know, unless I was going to be locked into just one photograph that I would have to copy everything in it, um, I knew I probably would want to take a person from this photo or a person from that one because some people just have a beautiful gesture or they're mm -hmm. holding something. But you want the perspective and you want all the lighting to match um, so that when you're selecting all your photographs, everything is taken from the same you know, height and the same lighting and everything. So you have, you'll have a whole bunch. I did the same thing in Africa with the Maasai when there were dances, or in Namibia, or or with the powwow. You find a spot and you stick to it for at least 10 or 15 minutes. Then you move and you get another spot and you stick to it. You 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 resist that urge to constantly move and 
do that. You can still get nice photographs from the moving around, but if you're planning on doing a large painting with a lot of people in it, that's the way you do it. So then once I had my references and I was back from our trip and I decided to do this painting, I this one I actually did a drawing of first. I did a charcoal drawing first to kind of work out where I wanted, which photos I wanted to use and where I wanted all the people. Now sometimes, like the one I did for the pre de West, uh, the gathering one, it was actually even more complicated than this one and so I actually couldn't, it just didn't work to work it out in a drawing because it was so large. So I actually started with one person in the center and uh, the main girl who's the only one looking at us and then I drew her out in charcoal on the canvas um, and then I slowly added more people in and built them on and sometimes I wouldn't like the person and so I would wipe it out, put another one in, and I slowly built it. It took maybe three or four days on that to, to draw. And I actually, I actually photographed that one, had like a camera on a tripod timer. So it was shooting every like a uh, couple minutes. And so I actually have a, a photograph of the drawing in process of that painting. So you can kind of see how I'd move per people. And so that's kind of how I built it. And then once that was done, I, I just start in painting on the, the, uh, uh, the main a center of interest person. Um, so, you know, sometimes I do a color study also to work out the draw the colors of that I'm going to do. I did that with the Indian painting, but I didn't do that with the uh, powwow one because I had the powwow one kind of. I was I had it pretty clear in my head what I what I wanted to go for. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's always the key too is having it clear in your head what you want to go for. And we we've actually talked that uh, a number of different times on our chat. So. Um, let's let's jump ahead to what uh, started you or what inspired you to write N Nihala, and when did you start writing it? Uh, let's see. Well, I'm, I've always written, and I've written quite a few novels and plays and short stories and stuff just on my own. Um, well, I've made documentaries too. Those those I, I don't really write, but uh, yeah, I've made oh, wow. some okay. of those too. Because um, actually, the documentaries I've made have simply I haven't done narration. It's simply just uh, I kind of use the Socratic method, and I just ask questions, and so then I edit them together. Uh, uh, okay. But Nahala um, is one of the novels I've written. I've written about five, five now, and I've I've written a lot. I never have shown them to anybody. I just enjoy writing, and so I would write when I'd have spare time or, or stuff. And so th this one, I just for some reason, I just like this one. I actually wrote the first draft of it uh, 20 years ago, tw 21 years ago. <laughs> And, um, oh my gosh! I did the same thing. It's, go ahead. Oh yeah, <laughs> it is, yeah. And uh, and I I would write a little here and there on it or other ideas and stuff. And then about three and a half years ago, four years ago maybe, I decided, you know, I'm finally going to written all these stories. I'm finally just going to, uh, um, you know, fin you know, polish one. So I'm going to rewrite it in many drafts. Right. As you know, that takes much more time than writing the first draft, which mm -hmm. is the first draft is so fun because you get all the ideas and everything down and then it's a matter of going back over it. I think it was twice as long as it ended up here even though it's a long book. You know, mm -hmm. I, I cut things down, I would add things and I used it also. The reason I chose that one too is because I really, in those 20 years, I've spent so much time traveling to other countries and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a readaholic and while I paint I also listen to books on tape. Um, all day, and I especially like history and philosophy and uh, all the different religions that I've studied. Everywhere we go, I talk to people, whether the Maasai tribe or we've been to, um, you know, Turkey or Muslim countries or Hindu countries, the Himalayas, Tibet, and so I really have had all these interesting discussions with um, uh, people in all these different countries about all their different views, and so I decided that the Nahala book already had a lot of philosophical kind of um, uh, big ideas in it and so I thought I'll use this one to kind of make it part action adventure science fiction story and uh, about technology and where we're going as a, as a species and also then to have discussions between all these various characters uh, about all the philosophical and religious issues that I've talked to so many people about. So the different characters have, some are Hindu, some are Muslim, some are Christian, some are atheist, and so they have discussions and debates uh, with each other about, about religion, but also about technology, morality, um, you know, uh, warfare, all these sorts of things um, through the story. So mm -hmm. it's kind of 
it, it kind of lent itself for me to just kind of uh, put all those thoughts and ideas that I've, I've been over the last 20 years really reading about and thinking about and you know even some of the people that I've met in the documentaries like Richard Dawkins and uh, Lawrence Krauss and uh, he's a physicist uh, all these different um, uh, interesting people that I've I've had discussions with uh, you know while doing the documentary it was kind of fun to weave some of those ideas in there in a little bit more of a, a thought out manner yeah yeah sounds great and it, um, I actually am in the middle of reading reading the book and um, am enjoying it very much so oh, cool. um, yeah it's it, it's um I, I don't want to give a, too much away you know because you don't want to give out like, plot points and all that kind of stuff <laughs> with the movie because I mean then why would people buy it? But um, if you yeah. haven't read it, you know, go out and read Scott's. Um, it's available out on Amazon. Uh, go out and read what Scott has written there because I think you have a little like description of the story and, and things like that. So um, right. You know, well, check in that fact, out. you can uh, you can if you go to the Kindle version. I think the book, the print version also. If you click it, yeah. you can read the first chapter uh, for yeah. free on there. So that way. You can make sure it's something that you're interested in, but uh, right, uh, yeah, it's kind of fun. Yeah, so so you went through the process of doing the book, like you know, writing the book, like you said, we started it 20 years ago. I started mine about, well, I started mine back in 1979 and did all the research and everything for it in those years because I meant for it to actually be published um, in the about the early 80s or so. Of course, mm -hmm. um, publishing today is so much different than publishing back then. Uh, in that you can decide to go a self-publishing route, which uh, I guess the the idea and the writing that I had been doing on it for 20 years was uh, a good thing because self-publishing then came along and I didn't have to worry about finding a literary agent and and going out and um, trying to get Random House or Simon and Schuster or some big name in traditional publishing to to uh, to purchase it, so mm -hmm. it's you know, that flexibility is really great, and it actually brings it around to you know we don't ask anybody when we publish our paintings, we just you know put it out there for the universe to see, and and now all of a sudden writing is somewhat similar in in the same way as now you can publish it yourself, and um, you're subject to critics just like <laughs> you are in the art mm -hmm. world. So those are a couple similarities. Did you find any other similarities between writing and painting, and maybe more so on the creative side than the... Well, you know, it, it's interesting because I wrote um, this book, and I've written so many, so many uh, different novels that I'm going to slowly start to finish now and publish. And I never, I never thought really much about trying to publish them. Um, I, it just seemed like such a, a lot of work, and I hadn't even put all that time into finishing one, so, you know, properly. And and honestly, I just wrote them because I enjoy writing them. But also, you probably had this experience with research, like 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 in Nahala, a, a lot of the discussions that people have, um, it forces you when you put down both sides of the argument to have people arguing the different sides, even though you may. Um, uh, agree with one more than the other, it forces you to really mm -hmm. find the best arguments for the other side. And most of the time, for me, when I was writing those things, I started to realize, oh, you know, it's not as simple as I thought. You know, I thought I had the answer. And um, that was a great thing in, in all my stories that I've written that, through, that has always happened to me. It's probably my, one of the themes, one of the big themes of the book is that Everything's more complicated than it seems at first, and uh, and so from writing, it it was part of almost a process of when I had something that I was interested in, thinking about, and I didn't really know exactly what I thought about it. I would kind of incorporate it into a story, and it would give me a, an excuse. When you actually write down the arguments, and have to write down, and have to research, you know, things that you took for granted, you find out, wow, you know, that's not actually true. The 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 thing that I had been thinking that I would that was a was an argument to support one argument or not. So that was mainly why I enjoy writing them so much. Um, so I think it was making the documentaries that made me think about publishing a book because um, the, all the documentaries that I made um, were simply, they're like, they're, they're more like um, kind of issue oriented sorts of things and, um, and it was only to put them on YouTube, although they have been shown in for some pretty big film festivals, I never submitted to them. I just put it on YouTube, and they've gotten a lot of views. Uh, probably the most popular one was In God We Trust, and that's gotten for, between all the different sites that show it. It's been over a million views. Um, 
And so film festivals sometimes ask if they can show the film, so I'll send them a digital copy. But that realization that, wow, you know, I can just make a film and put it on YouTube and have people see it. I don't have to worry about trying to get an agent or trying to, you know, schlep it to film festivals or try to wonder if somebody will ever see it. I think that's what, what made me then realize, wow, you know, somebody mentioned you can do that with books. I don't think I ever would have had the energy to actually do all the rewrites and polish and finish uh, Nahala um, if I didn't know that I could just publish it myself um, on, uh, on, on Amazon. And that's what I did. It was just so great not to have to think, oh my god, I've got to spend years trying to find an agent or a publisher. Because art, the art business is so much, we already have more than we want to deal with of dealing with galleries or filling out things for the shows and shipping everything. Um, dealing with rejection. Well, it's not so much rejection. It's just a lot of work, you know. Um, you have rejection in, well, yeah. in everything, but it's just I didn't have the time to to think. Oh, I'm going to try and you know. So so that's what made me want to publish it. Was like, wow, I can just you know, as long as I can just do the creative part, and then kind of put it out there if anybody's interested. That was like so fun. So I it was so liberating, and so I I uh, I, I love that about both. Um, doing the documentaries and, and doing that. And since I make plenty of money from the painting, I don't have to worry about, um, you know, it would be different probably if I was just writing because I would think, I've, you know, I've got to pay the bills. So it's kind of freeing to have that one part of my creative life where I don't have to worry about that much. I mean, you know, maybe people will read it. Uh, you know, so far a lot of people have seemed to really, really like it. So that's been a wonderful thing. Yeah, and... Um Let's talk about the exciting news that you were going to uh, share with us that I, oh, right. I uh, kind of Twittered out yesterday and Facebooked out yesterday that Scott was going to share some exciting news for us. And <laughs> this is this is um, this is really really big. I mean, from an author standpoint, for this to happen on a first book, I'm just kind of prefacing this a little bit, Scott, um, is like an author's dream. So go ahead, <laughs> Scott. What's the news? Well, uh, yeah, it was very exciting to me. Um, I, uh, uh, like I said, I just self-published it on on there, and so we've had sales there. But uh, a, a company called um, Skyboat Media, um, out of Los Angeles, that they specialize in uh, audiobooks, um, uh, p producing and distributing audiobooks, uh, contacted me, and uh, and you know wanted to uh, do a contract, put me under contract to do the audiobook version of Nahala through them, and uh, so it was. Like wow, it was wonderful because I, uh, you know, they they have such a prof they're a super professional place. They have a lot of my my favorite authors um, uh, that they uh, represent that they do the audiobooks for. The books are published through the actual print versions and, and stuff are published through regular publishers for their other authors. But um, like uh, Ursula Le Guin, uh, Orson Scott Card, who wrote. Um, uh, Ender's Game. They do all of his books, and uh, Harlan Ellison, Ben Bova, Robert Silverman, Silverberg, and so they they've got uh, a great. Um, they they specialize in science fiction uh, 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 mainly, and uh, so yeah. So I was just super excited. So I just know it'll be done well too because they you know, when they do the audiobooks they've got a team of five people: engineers, editors, and recorders. And the uh, for me the most exciting thing is that the uh, reader who is going to read. Uh, uh, Nahala is uh, one of my favorite uh, readers. I've read; she's done a lot of uh, the books uh, that uh, science fiction books that I love. Uh, she was in probably the most famous book would be Ender's Game. She did the sister's voice in that for their with their company too. And her name is uh, Gabrielle Decour, and uh, she's an actress in Los Angeles. Has been in movies and in uh, like 50 stage plays, but she's been in Ghostbusters and all uh, all, all sorts of different things. So. Um, okay, I recognized her voice right away when I talked to her because I because it's so <laughs> so funny how you hear books on tape while I paint and mm -hmm. then the the voice is like you know you just remember that voice so well so when I heard her voice I was like right away I was like oh my god I know exactly <laughs> it's like you know the person <laughs> almost so yeah so it's very exciting so it'll be uh, uh they their release date will be January 19th uh, through Blackstone Audio and it'll be on um, uh, CDs. Uh, and digital download. So the CDs will be in bookstores and libraries, and you can buy the CDs too through Amazon. But then also, uh, the digital uh, version will be on Audible and Amazon and all of that too. So, but it's just nice because I won't have to worry about any of that. They'll just take care of take care of all that. So it's, it's yeah. pretty fun. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. That's that. Like I said, that's 
that's like one of the one of the dreams that authors always have is to be approached like this and, and you know and who knows with the Los Angeles con, you know connection you may end up on uh, the, the big screen there so. <laughs> well I don't know it's it's a very uh, <laughs> philosophical book but yeah it's uh, it was really great I, I it doesn't mean anybody is going to order it or anything but I'm I'm just very <laughs> very excited to have some have a really true professional uh, right. Uh, read it, and in fact, it was funny because uh, they were talking to me a little bit about, you know, uh, you know, they, 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 you could tell they were a little sheepish because they're like, well, we really <laughs> would, would, would prefer to, you know, us handle the, uh, we have a director who handles the performances and things like this, and some authors really want to be, you know, involved in trying to, you know, direct it, and for me personally, I was like, well, no, I actually uh, <laughs> don't at all want to. I just would like you to do it because you're, you know. Everybody right. has a different interpretation. I, I know that even when I was in film school in Chicago after art school, one of my screenplays had been selected to be read by actors. Um, at the end of the year, they, they selected one screenplay to be kind of performed by the actors read. And mm -hmm. it was like astonishing to me to see how they interpreted it. It was completely, it's kind of like we're talking about where artists painting the same model. You'll see everybody do it differently. But that was the way it was with hearing uh, the reading of the story because they brought things to it that I had no, uh, you know, no clue and it sounded so so good to me. And I imagine if you had different actors, they would all interpret it differently. So that's kind of the way I felt like with this since it's somebody who is so professional and does such a good job. You know, it's like I would rather just have them do their interpretation of it, you know, it would be fun. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of like you, you, we realize when we're outside of our realm of expertise and um, like you said that how they're going to interpret it uh, may bring a whole new storyline for you in the future if for something else as well. So, yeah, that's that's part of the creative process that when you let go and just watch how other people's creative process comes into play. Uh, with that, that it's really kind of interesting to see how that goes too. So, so it know is, where you're yeah. coming from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because so they have their own creativity. It's really, really fun to see uh, anybody's creativity come out. You know, it's it's just, oh, wow. yeah. it's it's just magic. Yeah, it, it, the the look on um, students' face because I'm sure you teach workshops too, and um, you know the look on their face when they have that breakthrough is it just makes it so rewarding and and. Yeah, it's invalidating and, and all that. It's just so cool. And I, I said to you in a private email that we were doing, and I'm just so happy for you. This is just so great. Oh, and, thanks. Yeah, I'm yeah. Pretty, pretty, pretty excited about it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, one day, hopefully, I can stand shoulder to shoulders with you. But <laughs> yeah, What are you talking point. about? You've been writing <laughs> much longer. You, you've got, well, I've probably been writing as long, but you, you've, you've been publishing and doing all kinds of great novels of your own, so that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's it is fun. It's it, and um, I'm gonna skip down to a to a different question. Like writing was my first love. Sounds like writing may have been your first love, and it was something that we probably both um, protected a, a little bit. But um, I guess well, I really don't want to skip down to that question yet. Let's let's talk um, a little bit about hello. Some, Oh, can you sorry. Hear me? Can you I can't. Hear me? Go ahead. Okay, great. Yeah, sometimes it, it kind of like beats out a technical thing with GoToWebinar, so apologies if that's happening a lot out there. I don't know. I think it was but, my, my uh, USB connection here. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, so anyway, let's discuss one thing, and, and again, this is something that, that I see from students um, that I teach uh, that I think kind of interferes with our creative process, and I'm going to call it Fear. It, it keeps us from exploring things. It um, it represents itself as self doubt. Like I can never paint like Scott. Well, that's probably good because Scott really doesn't want me to paint like him. <laughs> and you know, but it's kind of like it, it's just it can just really zap the energy away from you. Um, it could keep you from exploring. And I think your book is kind of represented as is um, an element that. It has an element of fear in it. Um, Kayla's fear, for example, of science craft, um, that kind of thing. So, you know, how do you feel about? I mean, do you agree? And can you can you talk a little bit about the obstacles you overcame to become first the well, wonderful master artist and also the the writer? Well, yeah. I mean, it is interesting with uh, with Kayla, the main character of the story. Uh, Probably those people who who know my personal story realize that 
a lot of her journey is in the book is my journey. I mean, she's she starts out as uh, crippled, um, which uh, and I kind of give her. Uh, she only has one leg, uh, who, which is kind of foot that is twisted around. That's made her cripple, um, and that's you know I was born with club, club feet, uh, very severe club feet. So I was on crutches um, for much of my childhood, which I think is what um, uh, you know through all the operations, which is what uh, actually helped me with art and writing. Because I mean I was in hospitals a lot, I was on crutches a lot, and you know so um, you know I would my mom would bring me uh, books on. Um, on, uh, on how to draw, and I would draw from those, and I would write stories, and we would actually make little book bindings of them. I would illustrate them and draw them and all that. And uh, my dad's a writer also, and uh, so is my one of my brothers. Um, so that's kind of part of it. Um, and so Kayla's journey in that sense of, you know, science is what cured me. Um, I've seen people in India who, who had the same thing that I had, but they uh, are crippled for life because unless you have those things done when you're very young, they can't be done because uh, the bones have set too much and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I had been born 10 years before I was, um, I would have probably been uh, uh, not able to walk for my whole life. And um, so her her searching for science craft and her kind of thinking, why, why would God do this to me? And then looking for uh, a scientific cure uh, which is what happens in the book, um, is 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 very similar. So that and also her her kind of uh, spiritual journey, kind of uh, um, uh, is kind of symbolic of of what I went through. A lot of her questions are were my questions and and searching, and I feel, still feel that I'm searching when I don't in the book I don't ever give the absolute answer of what she's found because I feel like there's always a possibility of learning new things. Mm -hmm. um, that searching, I think, is probably uh, the, the main th you know, ingredient to overcoming your fear. Um, you know, just genuinely being interested in following what you're interested in learning whether it is, and it will be different for every person. So um, I, one of the reasons that I I, uh, Sue and I both love traveling and painting is because we're so interested in other cultures and like I said everywhere I go I read about the culture and I talk to people about their history and their religious views and all of these things and so it's part of it is just saying I'm not going to be afraid of sometimes it's I'm not going to be afraid of going to this particular country which is a little bit more um, you know iffy because it's worth it to me to experience this or learn these things sometimes it's a fear of of um, rejection, like you said about publishers not liking what you said or getting bad reviews. Sometimes it's fear of, of, of failing, of saying, well, I'm going to write this book or I'm going to do this painting and nobody's going to buy it or nobody's going to like it or it won't get in the show. So those are definitely all fears that we have to overcome. Um, there's no uh, formula. I mean, another thing, too, is it's, it was kind of a funny question. I've gotten this question so often when I've done um, talks on panels, and people will say to me, well, aren't you afraid you're, you know, the things you write uh, is more when I write than when I paint, although I write about painting, too. I get a lot of very uh, angry uh, kind of hate mail from uh, modern artists uh, when I when I did that uh, uh, talk and we put it on YouTube the banishment of beauty uh, mm -hmm. they're so angry about that and uh, then I get the same thing from people saying when I when I talk about religion and people will, will a lot of people ask me are you afraid that uh, people will um, not buy your paintings because you've offended them uh, uh, for whichever reason, um, uh, you know, a gallery that might have modern art too, or a collector who has both, or somebody who's very religious who d who doesn't agree with what I've written. Um, and for me, uh, I, I I really feel like that fear of offending someone is 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 also can really hold you back as an artist. So if you're afraid of offending anyone. The best way to not offend someone is to never say anything. And so uh, if you're going to be a painter or a writer or a filmmaker, I think you owe it to yourself as much as to any, everybody else to really say what you think and to paint what you really like or to write what you really, what you really feel because that's the only time you're going to really add anything uh, new or of worthwhile to the conversation is the only way you're going to learn also. So if you're afraid to say what you think, you probably shouldn't be an artist. And that goes with 
it just goes with it, being an artist, that there are going to be people, no matter what you write or paint, who are not going to like what you do or say. And, you know, so you just you just kind of have to have a thick skin. Although I can't, I mean, I have to admit, it just definitely does, uh, you know, upset me or bother me when people uh, uh, say certain things about paintings or, or stories that you put a lot of work into. Usually, I'll really try and take that and learn from it and think, do they have a valid argument there? Um, and sometimes they do, and I'll learn learn from that. And then other times, I just have to say, well, you know, that's just my opinion, you know, and I'm gonna have to keep. Uh, to it until I change my opinion, and I've changed my opinion on just about everything over the years as I learn more. So I'm always, you know, open to learning something new. But if I don't say anything, I might not even learn that I was wrong in my opinion because nobody will challenge me and say, you know, you know, I think you have that fact wrong. And uh, that, that's actually uh, uh, something I've I've tried very hard over the years. When somebody does, when I, we're having an argument or discussion on a pack trip or something like that, and somebody says something, I say, well, I think, you know, I'll use some fact or something that I think that I know to, you know, to back up my position. And then we get back and I learn, oh, that was wrong. I actually was incorrect on that, you know, that, that whatever I was saying. I really try and make a point of, of calling that person or seeing them in person and telling, you know, you were right. I was wrong, you know. Thank you for correcting me on that. And um, because you know, it, it's you know, it hurts our ego to say that. But that's what art is. That's what writing is. That's what film is. It's it's all a discussion. Um, and we can learn as much from being the artist. It's not that we're necessarily always dictating, you know, what's right to everyone else. We're it's a, a back and forth conversation. Now, a lot of times, the artist speak and writer or filmmaker, we have because we have a lot of extra time to pursue our art, to travel, to read, to study, to research. A lot of times, we do have uh, things that we can, you know, point out to people that they wouldn't have heard otherwise. And so, sometimes, a lot of times, artists or writers can have a lot to say on an issue. Uh, you know, Clyde Aspavig is a good example. You know, all the times he's painted uh, West, he knows everything so intimately, all the laws, everything. And so sometimes he will speak out on an environmental issue or something. Even though he's a very conservative person, uh, conservatives sometimes will get very mad at him because they'll think he's being political. And he say, no, I'm just trying to show you the, the facts that I've learned because I spend so much time out, you know, in the landscape, in this place. And so I see what's happening, whereas you might not be able to see it because you're, you're, you're working or you're just in this one place. I hope that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it, um, I think it was beautifully said, actually. Um, one of the, the things that has happened to me is I was giving a talk for uh, the book, my book, and I was out at a library, and the audience I knew um, the, that came in to listen, um, I knew there was a large contingent of folks from... Uh, women from um, the University Women Association, and you know, so I knew right away at the end of this my presentation, the question that I was going to be asked is, "What college did you go to?" And I have been asked that question all through my life, and I didn't go to college because my parents they couldn't afford to send me and be what I wanted to go to school for. They wouldn't send me to school for <laughs> anyway. So um, being the little hothead that I was, uh, I decided that I wasn't going to going to, to go to college and um, ended up then going to work right away for Corporate America at Procter & Gamble and worked myself up to manager before I resigned. And uh, then that question did come and, and it basically my answer to her was that I didn't attend college but that doesn't mean that I didn't learn every day of my life. And so I think that's um, learning does you know, being open to experiences and exploring and um, learning every day, learning something every day, checking your facts like you were talking about, I think that does go a long way in, in um, you know, dealing with some of the fears that we all face every day and um, may prevent us from taking that one step further. Um, I know when we interviewed C.W. Mundy, his, his whole you know, rant, or not rant, but cheer, cheerleading uh, through the whole thing was be fearless, be fearless, take that, you know, if you're worried about ruining that one place on your painting, go ruin it with something else so that you can build it back up again and prove that you can paint it a second time. So, you know, that they're very, 
if it were easy, everybody would ne would not have fear. If it was easy to overcome, we all wouldn't have fear. But it's it's not that easy, and you know, just recognize that it's just really what small steps towards something that gets you there. Soon. Well, yeah, and that's that is a good point. I mean, challenging yourself is so important. I mean, if I am thinking about painting something, I think, gosh, that looks really hard. I don't really know how I paint it. I'll catch myself and say, oh, well, then I should definitely paint that. You know, that's how you'll learn. Um, right. And so, yes, yeah, CW is absolutely right about that. He's he's a really good friend of ours as well, and uh, we um, have painted together. And uh, yeah, that I think that a lot of the really best painters uh, and writers and whoever it is, musician or whatever, you, you kind of have to have that 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 sense, you, you call it fearless or, or or whatever it is, to challenge yourself because it's pretty easy to, you know, get stuck in a rut where, I mean, there's certain things that you, you can, you've painted, you know how to paint, and you know that they will sell um, for sure when you send them out. And it's, so it's very tempting to just get stuck into painting that. And then you're not going to usually improve. It was just like when I, I used to play chess a lot in uh, Chicago and uh, that there was definitely uh, a different, two different mindsets. There were people who only wanted to play people that they could probably beat or you know maybe were very close in and then there were people who wanted to play people who were much better than them and and that, that's definitely the way I was I mean I didn't mind losing you know it was hard, it was it was always it was always a shock to your ego but I, I would learn much more by playing really good players than I would by getting away with uh, with weak uh, moves um, you know against people that I could beat and so I would not you would never approve if you do that and it's the same with painting and writing if you don't challenge yourself and force yourself to overcome that um, you know that fear because it's no fun to be out with people and painting or whatever and you know and, and just completely bomb your painting but that's the way you learn you know and uh, and I I, I I love doing that so right, right. <laughs> kind of, and, and as I said before to folks, it's like no one's forcing you to put that bomb that you just did out on Facebook. It's your choice, you know, to, to share that with the public or not. And you know, a little hint: most of the master artists don't share their mistakes. <laughs> so. Well, you know, sometimes though we don't know we don't know what's really good or not either. I mean, we have our own bias. I mean, when That's I look true. back at old paintings, I think I, sometimes I cringe and think, "Oh my God, things I did right at art school." It's like, God, and I was so proud of that at the time. I didn't realize how wrong that drawing was or the alignment. And it's the same with like writing uh, this novel. You know, when right. I, it's like you publish it, and you know, you you think, "Oh, I'm really." Happy or proud of it? Although actually, by the time I finished it, I was so completely sick of it. I thought it was so still I. <laughs> absolutely terrible. But um, and that happens with most paintings too. When I finish them, I, I see the mistakes, and and so you put it out there. But you know, it might not be as good as I think. I know that from you know from painting. At uh, yeah. you know, so that's yeah, it's always always a risk, and you just have to do that. And then you'll laugh, you know, in five years and say, God, I I can you know I. I can't believe I didn't know that back then, but you know, it it can just it can just wear on you if, you, if you're so worried about embarrassing yourself, you know, right. by putting out a story that's not 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 uh, perfect or later realizing you know problems in a painting, you'll just be frozen. You'll just I know people who paint for years and years and years, and they just think I'm just waiting until I really get good before I'm going to approach galleries. You know, um, that's you know that's just uh, you know, you'll learn a lot once you start putting your work out there. More than when you're just isolated by yourself. You'll, you'll. There's something about putting something or knowing you're going to publish this and people are going to read it, or knowing that you're going to put the painting in a gallery or a show. That just, it just ups your level. You know, you just say, I've, I've really got to go the next step further. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Um, I wanted to take a second to remind everyone, if you have any questions for Scott, uh, please type them in. Sarah is actually taking and making a list. Uh, the, there should be like a little window over there that says, I think, is it the chat? I think it's the chat area or whatever. Just type them in there. Um, Sarah is going to take note of those, and we're going to get to to letting you ask questions of Scott um, here in a few minutes. i got a couple more questions I wanted to, to talk with Scott about. Um, so are you going to, I think you kind of touched on this earlier, you're going to continue to write novels and paint? Oh yeah, I've always been writing them, but now I am I am starting to, uh, yeah, I, I'm always painting and writing, um, but uh, because because a lot of people have liked this novel, it, it, it has really spurred me to uh, uh, finish some of the other ones that I have. I'm cool. working on one right now called The Immortality Contract, which will... 
uh, should be done. You know, I wrote it a while ago, also, uh, but it should be done. Um, I actually wrote it as a play, but it should be done probably in June uh, that I'll publish it. It's a much shorter; it's about half the size of uh, Nahala. Uh, it's a simpler story, but a fun one. So yeah, so I'm just going to start taking one by one some of the novels that I've written over the years and uh, just you know rewriting them and polishing them. And it's actually a little easier because since I did finish this Nahala one. I learned a lot while I was doing that, going back over a lot of the, the technical um, writing issues that mm-hmm. I was rusty on, uh, you know, from, from a long time ago. And uh, so it's actually a little easier, you know, spotting all of the passive verbs and, you know, filters and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it, it's kind of fun. Yeah, so, I, like I said, I haven't gotten to the end of your book yet. So this definitely has an ending. There's no sequel for Nahala? Uh, there is a possibility of a sequel. It, it's almost like a completely different book. I, 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 I couldn't even hint at it without completely giving away the ending. But, yeah, okay, uh, well, don't do that. You'll, you'll, you'll <laughs> actually see at the end of it. It could be, but this story is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a very complete uh, story. It doesn't like leave you hanging and what's the next... Uh, it's not like a, a cliffhanger type of a story. Uh, cool. There could be a sequel, but it would essentially be with... with uh, with with uh, very characters. different characters and very yeah. different, but uh, yeah, you'll yeah. see when you get to the end. The end is is my favorite part. It's it's quite a uh, it's quite a uh, surprising. Many people have said it's a pretty shocking ending, but everybody seems to have, have really liked the ending. But uh, but uh, it, I, I don't think anybody's guessed guessed the ending uh, yet, at least that I that I know of. But uh, okay. that's my favorite part, definitely. Okay, well, I'm gonna continue on. Definitely, don't <laughs> give, don't give it away for me. So. I won't. <laughs> Um, so let's, um, let's let's move on to the I don't know if you have the outline in front of you, Scott, or not. But number seven, and I'm not going to go into the whole diatribe that I have before I ask the question. I'm just going to go ahead and and jump right into it. Um, when you decide to create a painting or write a story or do a documentary, um, and you decide to give it breath by sharing it with the masses, how do you keep the lions at bay from stopping you from continuing on doing what you're doing? So kind of going towards dealing with critics or or um, people who just you know don't agree with your positions and and things like that. Well, I I, I do think that it's uh, at least for me now um, when you're in school or different things, everybody's seeing what you're doing while you're doing it. But for me now, I I, I really don't like to have people look at um, a painting until it's past a certain point where I am kind of know where I'm going and it's going to be finished. So sometimes people will come in as I'm finishing and stuff, but uh, Sue's the same way. We, we really don't like to have people see it while it's happening. And it's the same with uh, stories for me. And, until I finished um, the first draft, I, well, I mean, I really haven't had anybody look at my stories until this one anyway. So, <laughs> but I, I, I would be very reluctant to have someone see, read, like, say, the first few chapters of a story that I was halfway through with because um, the problem is, is if somebody comes in the studio and sees the painting that you're kind of blocking in or starting, um, it, it, it doesn't look, you know, your vision, you have a vision of it, so you're kind of seeing it the way you're going to finish it uh, to look. And so you can be very excited, but from an outsider, they can look at it and it looks just like a mess. And so they might not be as excited, like, oh, yeah, okay, no, that's looking okay. And, and just the fact of their... Um, less excited about it um, can really uh, burst your bubble kind of and take your enthusiasm away. So, so for me, I don't like to show uh, people until until it's almost finished, really. Uh, and stories especially that way because, you know, when you write it out, um, the rewriting, like I said, with uh, Nahala, you know, it, it shrunk by half. I knew I had to cut it way down because I had all these philosophical discussions and things. You just tend to, I tend to over-describe descriptions and all kinds of things. And so you go in there and you say, okay, I think I did this as I went back through it in my third drafting, you know, basically said, okay, you know, take each each paragraph. I really tried to think, how can I say these four sentences and two sentences but have the same thing? And um, and it can be that way with a painting too where you've painted a lot I'll, I'll paint too much and too much into the shadow or to this and then realize, oh no, this has got to be simplified. So almost like just by taking a palette knife and going over a whole area or letting areas uh, become simple. Like this painting that's on the screen there, you know, there was a, I had too much stuff in the background. Um, and so I just made it a simple, the simple blue, not letting so many of those other little colors and things were showing through. And so the power of it 
comes through much more. It was the same with the hair. I'd, I'd done a little too much on that. And so oftentimes what you take out is what's going to allow you to really concentrate on what is important in the story or the painting. And so when somebody sees that before it's finished, uh, they're not, they don't, you know, they're not going to get, you know, that, uh, that idea. And, uh, and so, so yeah, so I, I don't, I don't like to show, show people uh, beforehand because it really, even Sue or, or, or anybody, and they might not even mean it. It's just, they're, you know, they're just like, you know, um, if they're not quite as excited, you, you, know, you, you know, you, when you're actually doing the, at least for me, when I'm actually, I go through a process, when I start a painting um, or a story, I think this is going to be the best painting ever, you know, <laughs> I'm so excited about this to be my best painting, and then there's a certain point in the painting where I realize it's not going to be as good as I had hoped it was going to be, as, as I have in my mind, and then it's a matter of trying to get it you know, fixing errors, trying to get it to be as good as I can, and then by the end of the painting, I'm depressed. Uh, whenever I finish a painting, the bigger, the more time I've spent on it, the more depressed I am when I finished it. Finish it was the same with the with the novel too, uh, because it's not, it wasn't, it didn't come out as good as I want, and there's really no more chance for it to get there because it's done, and uh, you know, it's just at the point where you have to move on to the next one. And so you start. I try to think about, okay, what did I do wrong? What could have been better? What am I going to do better next time? Mm-hmm. And um, but I always have this letdown, and a lot of times it eases off in a few weeks and I think okay no there's good things about it um, but then pretty much I have to instantly I have to start another one um, to have that hope again okay I'm gonna get it this time I mean it's, it's kind of the definition of insanity you know doing the same thing over and over uh, but I just and it's weird too because I, re- I really will believe it each time I start a new painting or story I think this is gonna be the one and even though I know in the back of my mind that I'm gonna go through that process um, so but in the beginning when I am in that super excited mode, if somebody else doesn't have that same excitement for it, um, or if they say something like, "Oh, that's cool," you know, I, I, I wonder why you didn't didn't do this, or you know, God, you had that one one photo that was just so cool. You, know, you should you should do that one. You know, then it'll just kind of like take your excitement away, and so you you need that to kind of get you up the mountain. That you know, that momentum in the beginning to get you up to that point. If you don't have that then you will never even get to that middle point where you, uh, so I don't know, that's my process. Not, not everybody's that way, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. I know people who just love everything they do, and, and they do great painting. So it's, uh, it's just it's my, own, my own problem, I guess. Well, I don't think so. It at least it was a good validation for me. I don't know about for the rest of our listeners. But, yeah, I mean, when I think about the, you know, starting a book or starting a painting, I'm really busy in, in the excitement of planning it out, and then... Um, Somewhere in the middle, I seem to tend to get lost a little bit, and um, it's not as exciting. <laughs> and, and then by the time I finish it, it's like, oh, thank God, that's over with. But <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, no, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's it's definitely a marathon. I mean, yeah. certainly writing the novel was. I mean, even doing a big painting, it might take me three or four months. Um, the novel was a vastly more, uh, you know, uh, of a marathon. Uh, you know, yeah. over over three or four years of. Even the rewriting, and it, it takes a lot of, uh, you know, persistence. Uh, you know, I, I just was in a routine of getting up every morning early and uh, and working on it. And, uh, you know, even even if I didn't get anything done that day, I just had to stay in that schedule because it would be so easy once I – I was actually really afraid that if I, I finally set myself a deadline and um, and said I'm not going to do any more after this point because I – you could just rewrite forever, you know. Oh, it's, yeah. it's it's uh, and so I finally did that, and uh, so yeah, that's uh, but it, it's it's quite a monumental um, thing, and I and I did probably tackle my most complicated novel, so it was, but it was fun to it was fun to 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 finally finish one. So well, they they take their turn on our center stages, and you know it's like like you said, you had to, you got this one out was your you feel it's most your most complicated, um, you know. This, the one that my first novel that I wrote, Blind, Blind Influence, that was the one that I had to get out the door. And, and now, luckily, people are actually sending me emails going, when's the next one coming out? And every time I see somebody else that in, here in town that sees it and says, you are writing, right? You're going to get the second one out here, right? So I did leave a cliffhanger sort of at the end. There is a closing to it, but there are also a number of questions that aren't answered. So 
Uh, I think that's yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. I, oh uh, yeah. It it is great. But I keep telling myself I have to do this in less than twenty years because <laughs> it's <laughs> not going to work real well if I don't get it out there soon. So th this question actually, Sarah asked me last last time we were on Art Chat because Sarah Sarah inter, inter, um, interviewed me. But I thought it was a great question. I think it fits for you as well, and I, I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway. How do you manage your novel fans and your art fans? Or do you just say, this is who I am, and if I lose folks because of who I am, that's okay? Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't really think about that much. I mean, I, 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 I don't know if I... There's probably, there's probably some crossover. I mean... Um, you know, there, I'm sure there's a lot of people who know me for I, this novel hasn't been out for that long, so I mean, right. I have a handful of fans. You know, you know, uh, it, it's only in the hundreds of people who have who have read read the book. You know, it's probably pr approaching five or six hundred now. But um, um, you know, and, and so and then painting, it's it's almost they're almost it's like different worlds now with the the documentaries. There's there's quite a few people who know me for those and don't don't even know that I. Um, do paintings, uh, and I get a lot of uh, people asking me if I will film this or film that, or and I say, well, no, I'm, you know, I just kind of do my own thing, and I'm not really interested in directing other, other, you know, like professional documentaries. Um, so they they don't necessarily overlap. There's probably some people who I offend in <laughs> one or the other. It's funny too because I've had a few people who have said who who hated one or the other, either the either the banishment of beauty. Or the uh, um, the uh, in God we trust, or the one I did in Reason we trust, and Sophia investigates the Good News Club. They hate those films because those did deal more with religious uh, themes, mm -hmm. and but then they loved the uh, the Banishment of Beauty, or vice versa. There's people who absolutely there's artists too who who have who have sent me through Facebook or emails who 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 love one or hate the other. So it's kind of interesting, but it doesn't seem to matter. I mean. Uh, I don't think that you have to take everything all together. So, I mean, there's artists that I completely uh, disagree with them on their political ideas. Really good friends of mine. We have great discussions when we go on pack, pack trips and stuff. doesn't mean that if I disagree with them on one issue that I'm going to not like their paintings anymore. Um, or if their paintings are good, I'm going to assume that they have to agree with me on everything else. I So I don't know if there's much of a... Uh, there may be... Uh, some people who have, um, you know, said I'm not going to buy Scott's paintings because of his, um, you know, views on politics or on, on whatever else it is. Um, but you probably just don't hear from those people, so you know, you don't really yeah. know that they're out there. I, I definitely have had several artists, uh, friends of mine, who have who told me when I, especially when I first wrote an essay on my religious views on my website uh, in the reflections area. Um, years ago, really just because so many people would always ask me about about my views when they found out that I didn't believe in God. And um, so I wrote an essay. On it. it was just one day. Like I wrote a 30-page essay on there. And just, just so that I could – because everyone had these uh, email uh, discussions and debates with me because um, I had been – I had been brought up Catholic grade school and high school and had been very much of a believer. And so I lost my, my belief uh, really just through reading history and about religion. And so they would want to have these discussions, and I was like, I can't do, I can't do all these email discussions. So I wrote it, put it on there, and so I had a lot of. Hold on, Scott, you're breaking up a little. You're, can you hear me? Even now, say this to me. They say, Well, you know, people are going to stop buying your paintings, you know, because you're so outspoken. You know, you can feel that way, but you shouldn't. Oh, okay. Okay, keep talking. No. Scott, come back. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going okay, on now. with audio. That's weird. No? Okay, we can hear you right, now. Go ahead. Away. Oh, now you're out uh -oh. again. There you go. Okay, keep going. Just keep talking. We'll can see you still hear me? Yeah, I can oh, hear you now. Helen? Okay, is it still is it still going? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. All right. Well, uh, I uh, yeah, I was just saying how. Uh, so several people said to me, several artist friends of mine said, you know, if you if you talk about those sorts of issues, you know, people aren't going to stop buying your painting because you're going to get people really mad. And um, 
uh, he actually mentioned that to a few of my other friends too, uh, uh, Jeremy Lipkin and some other friends of mine who, who had discussed some of these things on Facebook. And uh, But it hasn't seemed to hurt any of us. I mean, I, I, we were actually talking about that at Free to West uh, last year. It was like, guys, I sold all my paintings and won the the collector's choice and and uh, Jeremy and all my other friends who are somewhat outspoken on political and uh, other issues uh, all did well so it, it hasn't seemed to you know made uh, that much of a difference I I think you know in, in probably in some countries it would I mean obviously I get emails from a lot of people in uh, uh, Muslim countries uh, who love the Facebook discussion sometimes I'll put on something about religion or politics and People have these long discussions that go to like 500, um, uh, you know, uh, posts, and they're very interesting, you know, uh, uh, discussions uh, between people. And uh, I've had several people from Iran and from Pakistan and Saudi Arabia who have um, uh, they email me or or message me and they say, I just want to let you know this is who I actually am. I have to have a fake name uh, for Facebook because it's actually legal in my country to. Um, uh, you know, they call it an apostate to have left Islam uh, mm -hmm. or to be an atheist, uh, and so they 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 say it's just they can't believe how wonderful it is to be able to actually uh, live in a country where you can actually talk about these things and not be arrested, and so it, it makes you really uh, uh, appreciate uh, what we have in this country and how important it is to artists and writers and people who want to actually have discussions and you know um, about these sorts of issues and. Uh, and so I, I just feel very fortunate to, to, to be here. It would be very sad to have been born, say, 500 years ago. And mm -hmm. uh, in fact, somebody actually said to me, well, there, you know, there were no, no artists, uh, you know, who doubted, uh, you know, God or these sorts of things, you know. Um, you know, in the past, they all painted for the church and all that. And my, my <laughs> response is always, well, well, how would you know? You know, I mean, if you have... Uh, if it was illegal and you could be, you know, burned at the stake like uh, Bruno, or, or you know, put under house arrest and threatened with torture like Galileo, how would you know, you know, how many people maybe didn't really believe it, you know, if you couldn't, yeah. you know, if you couldn't say it. So it's 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 really only, uh, only very recently that we as artists and writers can actually, you know, say these things. And so to not take advantage of it would seem like such a such a shame you know just because you're worried that you know you won't make quite as much money uh, it would be just uh, just a tragedy to me the root of all evil oh sorry <laughs> <Back out of my laughs> <mouth. laughs> so anyway I'm gonna open this up Sarah to um, some questions hopefully that have come in for Scott okay yeah we have quite a few here so let's see let me open these up um, Catherine wants to know if you paint from photos or from memory. I paint from uh, life and from photos, and I sometimes paint from from my imagination. I, I haven't done that many from my imagination lately. Um, when I was in art school and just after art school for a couple years, I did a few uh, Dungeon and Dragon covers. Uh, I, I, I did them in watercolor, and um, those I would just do out of my imagination. So. Um, uh, those were fun to do, and it's not too hard to paint out of my imagination. It's just I'm usually more interested in um, painting uh, more reality-based sorts of subject matters. Um, I paint a lot of paintings. Like we go on trips, I'm painting from life every day. I usually do about two. It depends where I go and how big I'm painting. We're getting ready to go to Guatemala, um, and we'll be there for a few weeks, and I'll be painting people every day. So I'm hoping to do about you know, uh, uh, two, two a day there. So I'll be painting from life all the time. And then we'll get models here, or if I go on landscape painting trips, um, uh, I'll, you know, sometimes it'll be a month or two, and I'll just be doing uh, paintings from life. When I get home, usually I am most excited to paint from photographs, because like the painting you see on, on the screen there now of the Navajo woman, that's going to actually be in a show at the Maxwell Alexander Gallery in uh, Los Angeles. Um, later in the, I think it's December 5th, and I'll actually be giving a uh, slideshow uh, and talk about uh, the Miami Valley and the Navajo since I've gone there uh, a good amount and painted uh, people there. So, And Sue came with me one time too. So like that's an example. I would go out there and I did lots of uh, paintings. I would actually drive into the reservation with, with uh, friends who are Navajo who live there, and they'd take me to different relatives, some in Hogan's in the middle of nowhere, because the reservation's about 300 uh, miles uh, uh, wide. And 
a lot of the older people um, don't even speak English. They only speak uh, Navajo that are, are in the reservation. And so that's where I gather my material. Like this painting is a photograph that I took of this lady. Um, and so other ones, I, I, while I was there, I would do charcoals or little uh, portrait uh, paintings of people. But they're much looser. And so when I get home, I'm so excited to um, do a larger paintings in the studio. And so those I do from my photographs. Uh, that I did there, and I don't really use the sketches, the specific sketches, to to like blow up. Um, it's more that that experience of painting from life. So the photograph will, the face will be too dark in the shadows and too light in the lights, and so you'll be changing the colors. So you're kind of, it's not really your imagination. You're 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 kind of from memory in that way, and as as, as how light hits the face. So it's kind of a combination of remembering what all your experience from life has taught you. And then in this painting, I, I, uh, this lady uh, lived uh, in the monument, not in Monument Valley, which is a small like tribal park there. Um, and this scene is actually Monument Valley in the background. She lived maybe 10 miles on the reservation that Monument Valley is a part of. Um, but I used this background to go with her in that painting. Um, to, to do that. And so I, I have given some talks on, and I've had some panel discussions with people who there's different views and some people think no one should ever paint from photographs, that it's cheating. Um, I definitely don't feel that way. I feel like it is um, just a tool for uh, you know getting, being able to say what you want to say. And so if my subject is something that I can actually paint from life, I do that not because I don't feel that it's, it's any like higher of a you know uh, uh, you know yeah. thing to do it from life. It's because it comes out nicer in a different way. I've got all the colors and values right there for me, uh, to where I I can just copy it. It's a lot easier to paint it from life. But the photographs are almost always going to probably be my favorite paintings because they're subject matters I can get exactly the right expression, right moment outside with a child, with movement, with people. Um, the clouds just the way I wanted them. And so that's the reason for using the photos uh, rather than uh, painting everything from life. So I, I'm definitely not one of the people who are uh, uh, absolutists to say that the, the method is more important than the outcome. So there's plein air painters that, uh, even collectors that have asked me when I've done, when I used to do plein air shows on Catalina and Laguna, who would say, I want it, can you guarantee that this was all painted plein air and there wasn't any touch up done like you know in the you know in your hotel room or something afterwards at the end because I want only pure plein air ones and um, to me it's like well if you like the painting it shouldn't really matter that much if later on I try to fix some things in in the studio or not that that's putting the that's to me that's drifting too much into the modern art ethos that it's um, what matters is more of the uh, the idea uh, the concept then you know or these rules then the actual painting as a visual language to me I will use photos or or life I use all of them for for to get the best painting I can and painting from life is utterly essential to getting a good studio painting because if you're only working from the, in the studio from photos then you just start copying the photos and it's just going to become uh, it just won't look real, and so that's that's what's so important about painting from life. That's my opinion. I've been on many panel panels where where half the panelists all completely disagree with me and say <laughs> painting from a photograph is cheating. It is not really art. So that's that's so that's just that's just my my thoughts on the matter. Yeah, yeah, and I um, we had the discussion when we when we talked to each other um, a couple weeks ago and. You know how I feel. I feel the same way with um, as what you stated. So, thank you for stating that, <laughs> <laughs> Sarah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> and let's see here. Uh, the next question comes from Rebecca. Rebecca says, "You are such a wonderful artist. How do you find the time to both paint and write? What type of schedule do you keep?" Well. Um... I'm. I actually kind of think I'm fairly lazy, but I. Uh, I mean, I spend a lot of time, you know, going for hikes and watching TV too. Um, but really, you know, I kind of don't have. I'm not a schedule type of a person. When I'm really excited about a painting, I'll be working. I'm kind of a binge painter or a binge writer, 
I tend to get really excited about painting and I'll be just writing, I'll be painting all day, every day until I get these things finished or I'm really in it. And then I'll kind of get bored and I've gone through times where I've really just gotten bored with painting and I'll, I've taken you know months at a time off and not painted at all and I'm just either reading or writing. Um, all the time. Now, when I was doing this novel, I, I, because it was a big project and I wanted to get it finished, I was in a very much of a uh, routine where I, I, I wrote like about three or four hours every morning. I got up about four in the morning and I wrote, and then I would do my other stuff, painting or whatever else it was. And then sometimes I would also write in the afternoon. Um, so yeah, and Sue is a, little, a lot more steady than I am. She, she tends to go out to her studio. She won't do like the super long, long days, like painting 14 hours, 15 hours at a time, uh, like I will when I'm really excited about something. But she will be out there, uh, you know, every day painting most of the time. And so uh, it's just personalities, really. And things get done. It, it looks like I, you know, I work harder than it does. It's more cumulative. So if you just work a little bit, you know, on things, and you're just, you know, persistently working on things. It's amazing how things add up, you know, and you get a novel done or I'll take a break and do a documentary. And, um, so it just kind of accumulates and, and I'm pretty old, so, <laughs> so I'm, uh, uh, you know, time, you know, over time, it's, uh, it accumulates. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because I know how old you are. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm 48, so, so. No, I that, said I was laughing because I did know how old you are, which means oh, that yeah. you were younger than me, there sweetie. There you go. <laughs> You know, anybody anybody over uh, 25 is old, right? That's what I used to think when I was and, in school. Right. So. And don't tr and don't trust us old people either. Remember, us just right. trust anybody over 30. So exactly. <laughs> uh, this next question comes from Carla. Carla asks, when you write a book or story, do you always or ever illustrate it yourself? Um, I haven't illustrated um, any of my stories. Uh, I did a couple drawings of uh, in of Nahala just for fun. I was doing ones in my sketchbook, but I, I didn't publish them in the book. Um, I made the cover uh, myself uh, from from photographs, um, but yeah, I haven't really illustrated one. So I, it would be fun to do sometime, but. Uh, but yeah, I, I tend to just when I'm writing, I tend to really think language, and I I tend to be trying to um, create a visual, um, you know, scene and image and uh, of of the uh, of the novel through words. And uh, in some ways, I, you know, it's it's almost like I was talking about interpreting for the um, the reader, letting them interpret it the way they wanted to, the way they would think the voice would be, or the people would say things. Um, I would almost be hesitant to. To get too, uh, uh, I don't know. It, it would be fun to illustrate things, but I certainly would be uh, setting in the mind of the um, person reading the story what what they should think of that the character looks like. Where it is kind of fun sometimes to imagine it yourself. And I know mm -hmm. that even when I've met people who I've heard on the radio and stuff, some of the, some of the NPR people that we've met uh, at fundraisers and things that listen to yours, it's like they look completely differently than I had a picture in my mind. And I think that's similar with a book, you know, everybody kind of, it, it's, it's, I think that's one of the wonderful things about a book is it gives you the opportunity to, um, you know, put some of yourself into it, some of your own imagination into it. Now that happens with paintings too, where I love paintings things sometimes where I, I have the expression fairly neutral and it's always funny just to me to see I had a painting at Prita West uh, it had been on the cover of Southwest Art it was of an older woman uh, in the Monument Valley area uh, in Utah and um, she uh, was standing had a cat at her feet and looking out at the horizon and there were some mountains behind her and it was so interesting at the show how people came up and were so adamant they're like wow you know you painted her looking so sad like she's thinking of what's happened you know in history to the Navajo and all this stuff and then other people would say oh she's looking out she's so happy she's thinking about her grandchildren and this and that and everybody had a different interpretation uh, of it because I left it somewhat neutral so that they were allowed to kind of breathe their own story into it. And I like that with uh, with novels, too, that you have some room to imagine, you know, uh, the character. You don't want to just completely leave it blank. You know, you describe them, and uh, you want to get the sense of their emotions. But um, maybe that's why I haven't uh, felt the need to 
uh, you know, do really detailed illustrations to kind of tell people what I think. In the care, in like in my book, I have Ganesh, and I have all these different, different, different characters from, you know, that you you might have an idea of what they look like. Um, but I think everybody, it's kind of fun to have your own imagination of it. Yeah, I actually enjoy hearing who my readers like in the characters that I have, because I only describe them so much. And, and then to hear their reactions to each of the characters, which is so different than where I am with my characters, I, I, that is just fascinating to me. To it is. Yeah. Well, one of the funnest things for me was in the, in this novel, one of my one of my really good friends, and she's a really good painter now. She's retired. She's a history professor at Wake Forest, and she's written uh, uh, three wonderful books. She wrote one on Teddy Roosevelt. Her name's Sarah Watts, mm -hmm. and um, she read she read Nahala, and uh, it was funny too because as she was um, uh, uh, moving through the story, she told me, um, you know. I'm just getting a bad feeling about this, and I just have to tell you. She actually called me while she was reading it. She she couldn't she she just couldn't show it. She called me and she said, "I just have to tell you, honestly, if if you kill Kayla, you know, at the end of this, I'm going to be really angry at you." <laughs> and and I was so it was so funny because she was like, "No, I'm serious." I laughed, and she was like, "So she was like, no, I'm serious." And she goes, I really, really have grown attached to her. And um, and I said, well, that is the best compliment that I can get because oh, um, absolutely, you know, because you actually care about the character. And so that was so it made it to her, it felt like a real, real person. And I think that's the same thing I feel like with paintings is, mm -hmm. you know, I, I I like to paint things so that when you look at the people, even though you don't, you're not told. I'm not writing an essay about who this person was, what their history is, what their family is, but I want you to look at it and feel like I know that's a real person and you, you really care about them and you, you, they feel like somebody real. Now you can read into it. So I think in painting and writing it's the same way. You know, if you, especially if it's a painting of people, if you don't you know, have some sort of connection to them to where you actually start having an emotional attachment to them. I don't think that it necessarily will be a great painting or story because, you know, that's so I was very happy when she said that. I had several other people say that too. Um, and it was uh it was it was kind of kind of funny and, and I told her, well, I can't tell you what the end is, but uh, I'm glad that you you care about her. So <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, w I was threatened actually when I walked into the art center where I teach the one of my biggest fans is there and and she's, she just looked at me, she goes, I can't believe that you killed that person off. <laughs> Don't you dare kill anybody off in your second book. And I'm like cracking up, you know. <laughs> right. But it is, it is a great compliment because they, they've come to love that person and it's a, you know, that character. So, yeah, right. very good. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Um, this next question comes from M. Kaplan. And the question is, what is the most important thing you've ever learned from one of your painting students? Ooh. Most important thing uh, from one of my painting students. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. That's a good question because I, I learn. I really every single workshop I teach. I don't teach that much. I teach about one a year now. But um, I, I always learn from everybody. It's it's. I think that's one of the, one of the things that is great about when you start teaching is that you 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 take for granted a lot of things that you learned, um, and then having to put them in words makes you almost relearn them. So I'll be talking to people about, you know, values. I'll be talking to them about squinting and comparing. And you realize, oh, I need to do more of that myself, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's like reinforces those. So there's a lot of relearning that happens um, from that. I think probably one of the one of the great things that I learn from a lot of uh, the students, especially maybe not right in that moment, but as they go on to do uh, great things in their career. So there's been a lot of artists I've had who um, who I met when they were very young, like like um, uh, Logan uh, Ajish. Uh, is is a wonderful painter, and he he had taken some workshops from me uh, in Scottsdale and in Los Angeles when he was just starting out, um, you know, just out of high school. And uh, you know, and so I taught him all the technical things and stuff. But I learned so much by seeing his growth as an artist and going off into his own complete direction of things, uh, of what he paints. And so it's not really that like I learn like say a life lesson like, oh, you, you have to, you know, 
do this, you have to do this, or, or a technical thing. Because the technical things are all things that other people taught me that once you learn, you know, you learn. Um, so what I learn from students usually is a different way that they're seeing the world. Um, they'll interpret things in a different way, or they'll see a model, in, or they'll use paint in a way that you're just like, wow, that is just so cool. It's not something that I would want to copy from them, but it just it, it just reinforces how wonderful you know the creative mind is, and and how it reinforces. Don't try and tell people, you know, they should paint this this way. Just try and give them the tools and let them go off on on their own. So I, yeah, I don't have like a uh, like something that I can say. Well, this student completely taught me how to use a palette knife in a different way. It's more like they taught me that there is a different way you can use a palette knife that's right for that person. And mm -hmm. it always is a good reminder for me to try to reinforce to people that, um, you know, take these things that I'm showing you, but, you know, use them in your own, your own way. I don't know if that makes sense. It's probably, it's a really good question. And there's probably other artists who have even more dramatic things, uh, you know, uh, to say. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you. This next question is from Cindy. Do you have to obtain permission and or pay a subject to take a photograph and create a painting of them? Well, that that's a really good question, and there's so many different ins and outs of that. Um, so when we hire models to pose for us, like the one that's on the screen now is a, is a girl that I posed, and she posed uh, for me from, from life. I actually filmed this one for the first instructional video we did on drawing that, that, that we saw online. Um, and so I did a, th a three hour drawing of her, two or three hour drawing, I can't remember exactly how long. And so I pay her, and I, we pay the models like $20 an hour. Um, when we take photo, photo sessions, we'll pay them more. So sometimes, you know, $100 an hour because you'll be taking a lot of photographs over a couple of hours and using them for paintings. Now, I don't get, uh, I'll, I'll have like signed release forms when I have a model like this pose that I'm going to make, say, an art video of. Um, just because, I don't know, I guess I'm just in the habit of that when I do film. Now, I know some artists who have release forms uh, signed for by models for every single um, uh, time a model poses for photos or for paintings and it's probably uh, it's probably technically what you should do um, you know uh, but I don't I just uh, you know it's kind of a uh, uh, you know a, 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 a verbal agreement between you I guess you call it when you say you know you know if, if you pose for me and I'll pay you I'm gonna do this painting and you know and sell it in the gallery um, you know that's that's their agreement um, now when you go out in the field, and I'm in, say, Tibet or India or places like this, and you're shooting, you know, just you're you're in crowds of people or Africa. I mean, like, gosh, when we went to Africa, we were with the uh, trekking into the tribal areas, the Maasai. We had donkeys and hired some Maasai people from. The, I mean, nobody's gonna even nobody even knows how to write in there. They don't they don't have um, they don't they're not literate. Or, I mean, you're not gonna be ever be able to have. Or if you're in a marketing or taking pictures of people with a long lens, you can't run up to everybody and try and have everybody sign it. So, you know, I don't, I'm not like a, a lawyer, so I can't say exactly if that person could um, turn around later and, and claim that that's them in the painting and, and sue you for it. Um, it may be that, I mean, maybe it probably would only be an issue if you did prints and you did something that made millions and millions of dollars. Um, so yeah, so so for myself, I, I do I know when I do documentaries, I always have everybody sign a release form when I do the interview with them, um, because uh, partly because of the fact of even though I'm not selling it for money, I don't technically necessarily have to do that. I always do just because of the uh, uh, the nature of the documentaries that I've made. So for example, I'll ask people uh, questions. About religion and things that are that that are you know kind of weird. I've I've had several people threaten to sue me uh, because they said that they would. Uh, for example, I asked if 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 God asked you if uh, to kill your own child, would you? And so I had about 50 people who said yes, they would of of all different religions. And several of those people um, threatened to sue when it came out. And I said, well, you signed you know a release form, and they uh, they uh, um, uh, you know still 
uh, once I talked to them and I said, well, what would you say now? And they said, I'd say the same thing. So then they kind of were, were like, all right, I guess not. But uh, those were, oh, and then the, the one that was really a big reason for with the documentary was uh, we, I did one on, called uh, Sophia Investigates the Good News Club and we filmed this event of a very fundamentalist um, group who were targeting children. They wanted to uh, have children preach to other children in public schools and convert them by telling them they go to hell and stuff. So we filmed this and then the next day after the event um, we got mail uh, letters from lawyers uh, saying that they were going to sue us if we released um, any of the, the footage of the film. And I told them, well, I, you know, I had, they signed a release form, you know, the organization and all the people we interviewed. And they said, no, they, they say that you uh, forged all of those. And, um, you know, and our, and our lawyer said, well, they might believe you, uh, uh, you know, that you forged them, you know, uh, depending on what the jury is. And I said, well, luckily, I actually had videotape, turned the videotape on while everybody was reading and signing their release forms. Oh, so that wow. was the only, so, so they finally uh, dropped the uh, threat to sue. So, so people do sometimes, um, you know, uh, threaten to sue. Not really with my paintings. I think most people who are in a painting are feel honored. And oh, I always, good. if I know the person or if I know the models or even at the Indian powwows, I make DVDs and send them the photographs I took. And so it's not really a much of an issue with 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 that but um but yeah it's i mean it's it's a it's a litigious world out there so technically i imagine if you really want to cover yourself you could have everybody sign a release form but uh that's you know that's that would really hamper me in a lot of the things i like to paint uh, i see them almost like a documentary and with documentary sorts of things you are given leeway of uh if people are in a public space and stuff of uh of portraying them, and so I, I think it might cover that as well. But I'm not a lawyer, so I, I can't tell you. But it's a really good question. Okay, we have a few more here. If you have time to get to them. Oh sure. Um, Donna wants to know if your color theory DVD is still available. Yes, uh, all of our uh, 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 they're not sold as DVDs. They're sold as uh, downloads. Uh, so they're sold through. Um, uh, you can go to our website and, and click the uh, videos. So uh, just my name, scottburdick.com, uh, and uh, you'll see if you click the videos, there's a link there. Sue and I have ones in the color DVDs. It's not a DVD, but it's uh, um, a, uh, you know, a, a video, a lesson video. And those, it's kind of nice because we can sell those for a lot cheaper. Um, the main reason that we do them that way rather than DVDs, I, I used to do DVDs, and there's still some available through Lily Doll, but there's a place called, uh, uh, um, there's several organizations, I'm not even going to name them because I don't want to give them advertising, but they, uh, <laughs> they used a loophole, loophole in the law that uh, uh, DVDs that are for instructional purposes uh, can be sold, can be rented. And so what they did is they bought, they'll buy like 20, 20 of our, of our uh, DVDs, and then they've rented them thousands and thousands of times over um, without having to pay any royalty to the person who made them. So once that happened, we realized well, we can't really make these anymore. So when it became possible uh, to sell these things um, online, that since they're sold as a license to the person who buys them and not as a physical product, they can't use that loophole then to rent them. And in fact, we just uh, we just filmed uh, when last when we were visiting Richard uh, Schmid and Nancy Guzik uh, last year. We uh, I filmed four of uh, two of Richard and two of Nancy painting uh, my wife Sue and Michelle Dunaway, and we're going to come out with one of Richard in a in a in about a month. Um, and so I edited those together of him, and they're going to do it the same way online because they had the same problem. Uh, uh, of uh, having them stolen, basically, uh, and so it makes it really difficult to make them if you know instantly they're going to uh, basically be um, rented uh, for a very low price, and you you get no uh, compensation for it. So, yeah. Okay, cool. And then this next one is from Catherine. Have you always used acrylic, or do you have other favorite mediums? Well, I mainly use oil. Um, I have done acrylics. Um, a long time well, ago, I haven't done any. Oil. <laughs> she probably meant oil. Um, I have done acrylics uh, a long time ago, and occasionally on a trip, I've brought them with me and just used done acrylics. Um, I used to do a lot of watercolors as well, about half watercolors, and now I only do a few a year. 
Um, when we go to Guatemala on this next trip, um, we're going to be using water-based oils uh, because it's very difficult to get uh, uh, mineral spirits there. And um, mm. some of the new water-based oils are very uh, similar to regular oil, so so it just makes it a little easier to travel. But yeah, now I mostly use oils. It's uh, it's 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 uh, they're not that different. It's pretty easy to switch back and forth for me. I I tend to like to use oils more because I like to mix textures. I like to use mm -hmm. um, some uh, thick and thin and a variety of textures. Uh, you can do that with acrylics too. It's just, it has its own. Um, I think I'm just kind of lazy. You know, it, it's it's like uh, using switching different paints and things. It's it's like well, you know, I'm more interested in the story I'm going to tell, and oil is pretty versatile that I've got lots of possibilities to work with and so I don't I don't necessarily feel like uh, the need to uh, force myself to switch to that or th this or that uh, watercolor definitely I I do many times when I just can't think of how I would paint it in oil it, it just needs to be done in a watercolor uh, to tell the story that I'm I'm thinking of and so that's why I will I will still do watercolors when it's a subject that I just can't visualize, you know, doing properly in oil. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it did to me. <laughs> um, your best suggestions of how to get through the difficult parts of the creative process and what to do when you're completely blocked painting or writing. Mm. Well, that's a really good question. Um, now. It is different for different people. Um, now, for me, I some people just need to keep working through it. Um, for me, it's kind of a combination. I will, if I really just lose my enthusiasm in general for uh, a story or for a painting or for painting in general, I will just take a break and I will I will do something else, uh, mm -hmm. uh, reading or writing or taking a trip, um, going for a hike. Uh, setting a painting aside. Sometimes I've set them aside for a year or more and then come back to it. Um, for writing, for me, often what happens is I'm writing, 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 and then I kind of hit a, a block where I'm not sure what I want to do next or how I should do this. Uh, and I kind of am very much in the habit of I will go for a hike. We, we live right at the foot of a, of a of a state park called Hanging Rock State Park, and it's a little little mountain, and uh, and so I'll just go for a hike. I bring my notepad with me, and almost always when I go for a hike, you know, three hours or so, I will have gotten through the block. And I do that same with painting a lot of times when I'm really getting frustrated and it's not working, and I, I have to stop myself because many times if I just keep working when I'm in that sort of a mindset and I don't really know what I'm doing or what's going wrong. If I keep working on it, I'll completely ruin it and I'll have to wash it off. So I try and force myself to stop and I may go for a hike or I may read or I may write and and usually then when I come back with a fresh eye, I'll realize what I need to, need to do, what I need to fix it. But it can be many things. I mean, sometimes it's the fact that I just have no inspiration. I've, I, I, I've, I just have painted a lot of the things that I was excited about and I need to go on a trip. Um, I need to go out west and just camp for a month and um, find new inspiration or go on a trip to and I'll go you know to some other country and it will just get you all excited again uh, seeing something completely new and fresh. Okay and this is the last one here from Carla um, and you have probably already touched on these but I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, which did you start doing first, painting or writing? At what age did you start doing them? And why did you move from one into the other? Well, I definitely um, probably started about, uh, yeah, I definitely started at the same time and before I, I can even remember. The very first drawings and stories uh, that my parents uh, saved of mine were when I was in hospitals, you know, at the age of like five or six or so. Um, and coming home, you know, being on crutches and and you know, uh, sitting. So I was always writing and reading, and I was I was always interested in them. And I was always interested in film too. Those were the three things mm -hmm. that, growing up, I always was was thinking that I would do. And when I was in um, high school, I had my last operation when I was a senior in high school, and I was on crutches the uh, really most of the whole year. So it was like about six, five or six months on one leg, and there weren't walking casts, so they were on crutches. And then five or six months on the next leg. And uh, 
that really, I'd already started to take classes in high school for art, and I also then just also wrote. I would, would write stories and things on my own, and I loved uh, the English class. Um, but I didn't really know uh, what I was going to do in college. Uh, we weren't very well off, and, uh, and um, so it was a question whether I would be able to afford to go to college. And uh, luckily, because I was doing all that extra um, drawing, there was a scholarship contest for the American Academy of Art. And um, so I entered that, and I got a full scholarship to the American Academy. They only offered one um, for uh, you know incoming students. And uh, luckily, I got that. So I got to go to the art. So that kind of made um, my choice for me at that time. I had been also looking into um, film schools at uh, UCLA, but it was just way too expensive. And uh, even with a half scholarship, I, I couldn't afford it. And then Columbia College also. But since I got a full uh, scholarship, I did the academy. And then after I finished the academy, I, um, I started making a living uh, painting and was able to move out of my parents' house. And that's when I met Sue and we got married. And then I, for three years, I took classes uh, half time at Columbia College while I was painting. So I took writing, photography, and film, cinematography. And so I um, studied those while I was in um, while I was in school. And then once I got out of, finished with there, I, uh, I, I did a very brief, like, half-minute stint, you know, basically three months, uh, when, when, one time at uh, DreamWorks, um, working in development, both writing and painting on a, a movie called Spirit. Uh, several of my friends, uh, who, friends who, from DreamWorks who had taken workshops of mine, um, had, uh, had me come over there. When I was going through a terrible patch of, uh, with galleries, I had gotten cheated by several galleries, and it was just so down on the art market that I always knew I would still paint, but I was considering uh, uh, writing uh, for a uh, for a living instead for the films, and uh, so I did that for three months, and it was really fun, and the people there were so creative, but um, and they really wanted me to come out and 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 move out there and live full and and work full time for them. Um, but I really just realized I didn't really like working for other people and working on other projects. It wasn't the kind of writing I wanted to do and the type of stories I wanted to do. So that kind of turned me around and I stuck with the painting and, uh, you know, and, and things got a little better. But it was very frustrating for a long time, you know, having galleries, going to galleries. The last draw was we'd had this happen before. Uh, we went to a gallery in, uh, in Carmel and they had all the paintings priced, you know, several thousand dollars higher than we had set the price at and they were selling them and giving us our commission out of the low price but not telling us they and keeping the extra and uh, that's kind of an old story every artist probably has those but it was just starting to get you know and then uh, other galleries that had not wouldn't pay wouldn't pay pay me in and so um, so there's frustrations with it but so I continued to write though all the time not 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 like uh, constantly but I would go through like I said binges where I would be writing for three months and just doing just that writing a play or, or a novel and uh, so yeah it was just you know so it, it doesn't feel like a, like a big switch for me really it's just it's just the fact that I'm actually putting it out there and people are reading it and which is kind of fun you know uh, mm -hmm. but uh, it's for myself it doesn't feel like I've, I've switched from painting to writing I've I've always done them and uh, done them both and uh, but it is kind of fun to Put it out there. I had to. I had to, like you were asking before, had to be brave and put it out there and let people read it. And you know, and 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 it seems like most of the uh, reviews have been very good. So that's been been nice. But I'm sure there will be people who who absolutely hate it. My favorite review, in fact, I think was uh, somebody who um they seemed to, they liked the book and they actually originally gave it two stars and changed it to four stars out of five. But they, they the review sounded like they, they loved the story and the characters and all the stuff and and the actual writing itself. Uh, but then they had they were obviously very uh, a very religious person because they said at the end you know um, that uh, if you're into phil philosophical discussions you will like the book, but if you are are very uh, religiously committed, uh, he said he was quoting uh, he's doing a quote he's of, of some other author and he said. Uh, this book uh, should not be uh, tossed aside lightly. It should be thrown with great force. And so <laughs> that was kind of, you know, fun. So, but uh, yeah, I commented you know, so. on that one. I remember that on Facebook, Scott. I commented. Oh on yeah, that. yeah. But I thought it was actually a good review because it was it was actually warning people who might. I don't really. It's just like yeah. uh, in my website and stuff or Facebook page. People, I get a lot of complaints where people say, "Could you please just stick to talking about painting and not talk about?" <laughs> 
politics or religion or other things. And I always kind of feel like, well, you know, it's not like I'm going up to your door and knocking on your door and, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and trying to, uh, you know, uh, preach to you. You know, you know, it's it's my Facebook page, you know, so you yeah, don't need kinda... to come and read it. So it's a, uh, but I feel that way with the, uh, with the novel. I was glad. I, in fact, I like that review because it warns people who, who this might not be their, their thing. Yeah. Because uh, I don't really purposefully want to offend anybody. I just, you know, um, you know, it's just my thoughts. Yeah, I always I always liken like Facebook to to my front yard, and it's like my wall is where I can put anything I want, but you're not allowed to come in and put a sign in my yard unless you ask me. You know? <laughs> so it's like you, you wouldn't do it to your neighbor, so why would you come on my Facebook page and you know post something? So that's right. kind of the way I think of it. So. But I understand. I mean, uh, there, yeah. there's definitely people who I'm sure my book uh, and paintings. You know, there's people who just hate. My paintings too. I mean, it's the, the especially when I wrote the Banishment of Beauty. It was it's kind of funny to read some of the comments <laughs> people write. I mean, they just are so angry because they love you know uh, modern art and they they think uh, what I do with this is just the most useless, worthless you know uh, thing ever. So you know that's fine. You know I I but you have to be but it is it is fun to put it out there and just right. uh, you know um, there's people who like it and people who don't and uh, you know I I I think everybody has has the right to their opinion, and I enjoy hearing their opinion. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> all right. I think we got to all the questions. I just want oh. to share the special coupon code that we have with everyone and remind folks to check out artistnetworkuniversity.com. Um, and then the coupon code is artchat10, and that will save you 10% off your entire order over at northlightshop.com. So be sure to take advantage of that if you shop with us. And um, I just want to thank you, Linda and Scott, for doing another art chat with us today. So, Linda, if you want to go ahead and wrap things up on your end, I think we're good to go. Okay, sounds good. Um, again, Scott, thank you so much for joining us um, and, and spending extra time with us. So I appreciate uh, all your time and everything that you said. It's uh, I think this is probably one of our better art chats as far as um, you know, information shared and definitely in length. I think you're the longest one that <laughs> I've had yet. So, um, and very long-winded. I certainly. Oh, no, no, I didn't mean that in a bad way. I meant in a good way. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, that was uh, really fun. I'm glad you guys do these. I'll, I'm going to listen to some of your past ones. That'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'd love to have you on again, and we'd also like to have Susan on. So if you could pass that on to Susan, I'd appreciate it. Um, I'll we'll tell her. I'm sure she would love to do it. Yeah, so, and you're off to Guatemala um, next, right? Yep, we are, with uh, a friend of ours, Kathy Anderson, who's an incredible painter. Um, uh, so we're going we're gonna to go with, with her and her family. It'll be really fun. Her son lives there, so. Cool. Sounds great. And, um, again, they can purchase the book at Amazon. And um, is, is there anything else that you want to share with us before I tell them about the next show? I better not, or I'll, I'll go on another half hour. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks again so much. And uh, just so you all know out there, uh, let me flip on to my, my notes here. Um, the next art chat will be on November 16th at 11 o'clock Eastern. Um, we're actually going to be talking with Corey Miller, who is a podcaster. She's a creative entrepreneur. She... Um, I, I've just started actually talking with Corey, so she's she has so many different businesses that it would probably take me another 15 minutes to talk about them. But she is also a writer. Um, Backporchwriter.com, I think, is her website. If you want to have a, a check her out beforehand, but we'll be talking to her uh, about creative entrepreneur and how she manages all these different businesses. Like she has a, a tea uh, exchange or something or has to do with uh, you know like hot teas, brewing teas, and, and different things like that. And, and she's kind of like all over the map. And how she keeps herself organized is going to be one of the topics that we talk about. And um, I think that's pretty much Again, November 16th at 11 o'clock. And I think that's pretty much it. Sounds Thank exciting. You I look yes. forward to that one, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So thanks, everyone, for joining us and hanging in there for um, – this long time, but like I said, Scott had some great, great information for us, and, and I was so glad to have him on. So thank you again, Scott. Thank you both. All right. Have a good day, everyone.
Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.